Virtues make our life better. Let us ponder on our virtues. Virtues for life. Hello and welcome to Virtues for Life. This program is a conversation between Brahma Kumars and Kumaris about virtues. Virtues are the foundation of our life. And as much as we inculcate values, virtues, powers and qualities, to that extent we express our true nature and we become real contributors to global positive change. The laws of spirituality have told us that if we really want to be a catalyst for positive change, it is through personal transformation that we can accomplish this. Anyone who creates time in their lives, space in their day for practicing spiritual practice, spiritual values, meditation, taking time for introspection. They become not just consumers in the society, but true contributors. Today's program is about responsibility. And with me in the studio is Ruth Little. Welcome to Virtues for Life. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. Responsibility is one of the probably most powerful virtues. Sometimes it can feel a little bit heavy, but let us see how we would choose to define it today. Responsibility, what would you say? Uh, for me, responsibility is means doing what is necessary, but with a lightness and a detachment which ensures success. And irresponsibility? Is to have, there's some aspect of carelessness, um, which could manifest as laziness or um, inattention, lack of knowledge, a sort of ignorance, um, that would bring additional challenges to the task. Now you are in a position of public trust mm -hmm. and therefore you have certain very specific things that you are responsible for, people that you are responsible to. Uh, would you like to describe your sense of what your responsibility is as a Brahma Kumari a uh, coordinator in uh, the centre in Manchester, where you are in, in England at this time. What I've learned from this knowledge and this study is my responsibility actually is to God and to be a, an instrument. So the responsibility is to be a good student and a faithful child. And the task, in a sense, is secondary. If, first of all, I'm working with soul consciousness, with feelings of love, of benevolence, good wishes, then the task will flow, the task will happen. Yes, I have to do things, certain things physically. How do you define the task? Um, the task is whatever action needs to be. It might be cooking, it might be organizing an event, it might be making a phone call. But before I do those, I need to make sure that my state of mind, my spiritual presence is there. So what would be your responsibility to yourself? Um, I need to look at the responsibilities of a good child and a good student. So what is that? Um, a good child, if we think of um, sort of the aspect of filial piety of, you know, obedience and love and respect for the, the parent, I should make sure that whatever I do is reflecting um, the upbringing that I have, the nurturing that I, I have received, the good manners I've been taught by my parent, and which you, is God. Do you find that that flows very naturally, very easily? It's becoming more and more so. What sort of 
um, obstacle would you find in that? Um, it's when I forget um, that connection with God. When I start relying on my old sanskaras before what's an old sanskara okay my old personality traits so i was in no, my what, mid 30s what yeah, oh, yeah i was in my mid 30s when i came to this knowledge okay and i was a, a successful professional educator i'd had you know good jobs and i'd had positions of responsibility in all the schools i'd been in so i was very capable mm -hmm. now what can happen sometimes is I start doing things alone rather than with God, with that connection. And so then I can be taken down an old path of, you know, some subtle desire or some old stuff can erupt and I'm on my own. It's, I've distanced myself and then I have to recover myself. As a person in the Brahma Kumari Center in a position of responsibility, um, the people who come to the center, the students, the visitors, what is your perception of their expectations of you? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, many of the people who come don't really have any expectations at all. They don't know where they're coming. They're coming to a building called Inner Space. They're not quite sure. And they come for the first time and they're, many of them are overwhelmed by the atmosphere because it's so silent. Mm -hmm and nurturing and everyone is so genuinely welcoming and loving. They feel that and they feel there's something special for them there. And once they've got used to that and they start, you know, taking benefit and so mm. on, uh, then they may start having expectations. When, yes, after a while they might. And I think for many of them, especially those who've been coming to the Brahma Kumaris for a long time, they may have an expectation that my progress, my spiritual progress back to a state of completeness and equality to God might be a little faster than it is. So when my irritation shows, my tiredness shows, a little bit of tension behind the smile, you know, where the smile, the sparkling face doesn't quite match, it's not quite honest, it's not coming from the depth of the heart, they might feel, hmm, What's that? So would you say that you have a responsibility to fulfill their expectations or not? Um, I still think the responsibility is to God, to be a good student and a good child, because then everyone else will be happy. If I can please God, everyone else will be happy because I will be my best that I can so be. So now you're not a people pleaser then? I have that. Um, that tendency, it came with this black body living in a white world <laughs> to try and be liked and accepted yeah, in yeah. a very racist society. Yeah. So how do you deal with an atmosphere of racism and people looking at you through the filter of skin color and so on? Um, well, actually soul consciousness has been a, a great help there because if I don't see them as a, a white person or any other person, then I don't think they see me as a black person. I had an experience in Manchester where I'd just moved back to the UK and I didn't have any sort of clothes. And I found this wonderful Ghanaian, this uh, West African outfit, beautiful. And I bought it and I went out giving leaflets. And I actually experienced hatred really? in someone's vision. It was shocking. I've lived all over the world and I've, I go beyond, you know, people's shock um, and, you know, distaste at my body. But that, it was venom. So how did you manage that? I didn't wear the outfit again to go leafleting. <laughs> but it, it was, it just made me realize that people are not as nice as I think they are. You know, usually I think people are lovely. I see their highest self, even behind the stuff. You know, I just see, I see them as I used to see school children, primary school children, as lovely souls with vast potential. Mm -hmm. And that's the protection. Do, do you think, what, do you think, now we're we bringing up this question of hate, which mm. is, um, you know, there's hate crimes yes. and, and the emotion of hate, racial prejudice and so on. Um, and we're talking about responsibility. Um, is it possible to, through your consciousness, to shift another person's consciousness? 
Yes, it is possible. And what is needed? Um, I need to see them in their highest form. I need to see behind the hatred or behind whatever's manifesting, see the need. Because what I've, I've found to be true is that people in terms of feelings, they need to feel loved, understood, respected, valued or safe. This is so do, do you think that hatred is connected with a feeling of insecurity? Yeah, yeah, fear. Why would people feel insecure? There are many reasons, but I, if I take um, Manchester now, people are feeling very vulnerable because of the financial and economic state of the world. Mm -hmm. Before, when people had enough money, they felt they had some power, some control. I've even met uh, Brahma Kumaris who feel more secure when they've got money in the bank. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is, this is one thing, and from that, um, some of the hate crimes and the racism comes, the perception that immigrants are coming in and taking jobs that are there for other people. All this stuff balloons. Um, so what's needed is to be able to give people a sense of safety, of something beyond the physical, of a connection with something great, of wonder, uh, a wonderful drama that's just playing out, but, uh, but it's okay. Now, we have been um, receiving teachings uh, very recently uh, from Baba, from Bab Dada, to uh, serve through the face, yes. through happiness. If you are in your inner happiness um, uh, with part of that sense, okay, my happiness is part of my responsibility, it's my responsibility to be happy. In fact, we have even made a pledge to stay happy under any circumstances. How does that serve? Um, the happiness that Baba was talking about is genuine happiness and not the superficial, um, not the, obviously not the, uh, the smile of the um, person at customer services. It's a genuine, deep and spiritual smile. And I, I've experienced that if I have that, and if I can draw on genuine experiences, if I can tell people this works, I have been through something similar, then I can lift. I can lift them into a place of where they can see possibilities. So can you move from if then to this is what I am and this is what happens? Um, I'd like to say yes, but I need to experience it for myself. I believe it's true, but I, I'm not aware that I've done that. I, I am aware that I have given other people an experience, but I haven't had feedback that I've done that ex specifically. Okay. But I believe it's possible. Yes. I'm going to experiment. Can you be it independently of feedback? I can experiment, but it's just that my learning style. Um, I, the way I learn, I can see unlimited possibilities. And so when I hear I have to serve through my face, I'll need to experiment with different ways of doing that. Do you look in the mirror and try it out? Not usually, no. <laughs> Maybe I should. <laughs> no, it's usually in teaching because I teach some classes and things. Yes. And people, so, it's not I'm seeking feedback or anything, it just comes. Yeah. And then I know, ah, that, that works. So what's the responsibility of a teacher? Um, to share an experience of truth, to encourage others um, so that they can see unlimited possibilities. And when you're teaching Raj Yoga, what is it exactly that you want to convey to people? I want them to feel God um, through me, um, through a meditation commentary or through some words. And I find that Baba 
uses me like that, I'll speak and I'm not so sure what I'm going to say, a little bit like this interview, I don't know what I'm going to say, but often I will say something and sometimes think, oh, ooh. <laughs> and afterwards I'll say, you know, when you said da da da, and so the connection's been made. So I want them to feel that God is there, God is listening, God's with you. So when you are in remembrance of mm. God, how do you put yourself in that connection? It's a feeling, and so I imagine that Baba is, is just there, and I am connected with the light, and the light is coming through me, through my eyes, or it's going with my words, and it's touching them. Or if I'm reading the Murali, or reading it, uh, something, a virtue card, to go into that experience so that the soul gets a message, even if they don't know at that time, a seed has been planted, so that when they think about God, the, the mind knows where to go or what to feel. Responsibility also has this connotation of the ability to respond. Yes. So um, can you talk a little bit about how in your uh, life as a spiritual student, practitioner, teacher, uh, how it's enabled you to respond to different kinds of um, issues or challenges that have come up? Um, hmm. I think because I have a, tr a teaching background, um, and the kind of teaching I was doing was very holistic teaching. Then it wasn't, it wasn't tradi traditional, stand in front of the class and tell them what to do. So what is holistic teaching? Um, it's, it's teaching the whole student. So it's not just the academic. The ad academic is very important. For example, I'm thinking in uh, Malaysia, where I taught in an international school. It was purpose-built. And that's actually where I took this knowledge. Um, the idea was to create an atmosphere where students would want to learn and they would attain at a level that would get them into the best schools in America, but that they would be all round wise people. So to get a person to be wise, mm -hmm. what are the ingredients? Um, what we were doing there was we were offering experiences for the children to explore and reach their own conclusions, discuss, so that we could um, help them see the whole picture. For example, um, in a, an international school setting, the students would have maybe a very fortunate upbringing in, in terms of material comforts. Mm -hmm but they might not um, recognize the strengths and capabilities of the host nation mm -hmm. because the, the people they were in contact with were drivers and servants and maids. Right. So to bring um, role models into the school so they it could see, to take them into a kampung, a, a well-functioning local community to speak to the, with a translation, to speak to the chief about how he dealt with issues of crime and to broaden their minds so and that must see have other been possibilities. A big eye opener. Mm, it was. Did that help you deal with, um, uh, say, in Manchester, where you get groups of people who have been raised racist? Mm. Uh, how, how has that helped you? Um, I haven't consciously come into contact with people who've been raised racist because many of the people who find us are spiritual seekers of some mm -hmm. sort. But I have been working with um, a group of um, the Pankhurst Centre, which is a drop-in centre for women, mm -hmm. women-only centre, and they have a rape crisis centre. Many of the women have suffered or are facing challenges. And so I, I have been able to perhaps help them see other possibilities, that it's not just men that are the problem. So um, this is a so huge crisis in India, mm. uh, very much. It's been in the news. There's been more and more and more horrific uh, incidents of rape. It seems to be a, an epidemic. And you're saying that there is a component where the women are actually 
you know, setting themselves up for this. Could you talk about that a little bit? Because that comes yeah. into the area of responsibility too. Yes. yes. Well, um, I've been working with the Brahma Kumari Self-Esteem Project mm -hmm. and uh, with hate crimes, with any um, anything where people are experiencing ex intense negativity, um, self-esteem, building self-esteem can help. Um, that it means before the event or after the event? I think both, event? both before and after. Do you think a person who has low self-esteem is more at risk mm. to be a victim of a hate crime? I do. Um, I'm not an expert, you know, of the psychology of these things, but I have experienced being in a situation of fear myself and of being more vulnerable as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, if I can minimize my fear and walk in a state of, of love or self-awareness, um, I think I'm not attracting the same attention necessarily. I've experienced that myself. Um, so, if people can see their beauty, and I experienced with the group I worked with, they were so open to that. They loved they loved virtue cards, they loved um, affirmation, they knew they were good, they knew they were great, and they just needed to be reminded. And when they were in that state, for the time that they were thinking in that, on that wavelength, they were free. Okay. They were free. So, um, when a person is internally in bondage, they are more at risk to violent crime? I would suggest so, yes. So the solution to it, would you say, a spiritual um, practice in every person's life makes them less vulnerable to violent crime? I would say so. If I was connected to the Supreme and stable in the feeling of my spiritual greatness, um, my eternity, that this was just a small scene in, in eternity, can a person actually um, defend themselves against violent, violent crime through their state of consciousness? I believe so. I don't know if it was a fluke, but I've done that. It's so sort when of, you did that, what happened? Hmm. What were you doing? I was... Um, Can you describe the yes. incident? Yes. There was uh, someone who was a bit strange and um, I just with my thoughts, and it wasn't hatred, and it wasn't fear, it was just me being soul conscious and being a master almighty authority, that feeling of, of having control and having power, and just sending a thought, keep away, and it was, there was a, like a flinch. Mm -hmm. And you could feel the person being uh, actually instructed by your thoughts. Yes. And, and following yes. that. Yes. So this is something that can be, I think, very useful mm. uh, for people. Um, what about, I know there are a lot of women who are socialized to think of themselves as weak, vulnerable, mm. and likely to be um, uh, uh, harassed and um, damaged. Yes. Um, what should one do to handle that kind of socializing? I think if if those people were free to attend a meditation course, just the basic, you know, seven-day Brahma Kumaris course, it could offer them some insights. Um, and if they wanted to change, and they took the help of God, they could. Sometimes a person doesn't even know mm. that there's anything wrong with being socialized mm. to mm. be vulnerable. Um, in a situation like that, where you just see many, many people expecting to be abused, mm. um, what do you do? Um, Are you a role model? You could be, um, but uh, one is to be in a Brahma Kumari Centre offering a service. If I was out a Brahma Kumari living out and about and in my work, through my work and my interactions, if I was showing another way of being, that would be very effective. 
And as a Brahma Kumari in the center, you not doing that? Um, in my particular situation, <laughs> rarely go out we're so busy so that's why I'm a little reticent mm -hmm. to say but people um, come mm, people come so you are a role model yes yeah through the teachings and the experiences and the encouragement definitely we can do that because people watch you don't mm. they yes they do um, but what I was thinking more when I was teaching in Korea in the university people mm. were watching me and seeing possibilities in Malaysia my colleagues were coming up and one of them said, teach me to meditate because they were watching me. But So it's a little bit different now. I'm not out and about and working. Mm -hmm. um, my job is in the center. So I know there is a possibility, yes, to be a role, role model. Yes. And can you be a, are you a role model in the center? I hope so. I hope so. That's my aim. That's my aim. Um, do you uh, have interaction with young people and children also? Um, a little. We do have a children's group there. Uh, we don't have a youth group. Um, and the students who come are largely over 18. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe we have some in the twenty their 20s. And it's very encouraging to see um, young people looking for spiritual solutions. What do you feel... Um, within the current world situation which is quite honestly quite depressing mm. for many people young people don't really see much of a future for themselves um, uh, what do you see as your responsibility to the youth um, my responsibility is to find those who are natural teachers who have that um, enthusiasm to go and help and most most people want to make a positive difference but um, some have just natural leadership and those sort of um, personality traits of giving and sharing. To find those and empower them to go out there and make a positive difference because they are the ones, they are the role models. They, are, they know the world as it is now. Thank you so much, Ruth Little, for your wisdom and insights. This program has been on the subject of the virtue of responsibility. Let us consider for a moment the feeling of responsibility. We are responsible for our thoughts, our words, our actions, and ultimately, according to the laws of karma, we are also responsible for what happens to us. We are also responsible for the atmosphere and feelings that we generate wherever we are. So let us think for a moment about that feeling of being willing to take responsibility for what we are and what we do, and in that way contribute to make this world a better place. Thank you for joining me and Ruth Little on Virtues for Life. We have been talking about the virtue of responsibility. See you again very soon. Om Shanti.